What's up, Raptors fans, and welcome to Raptors Endgame here with Raptors Republic. It's a podcast where we talk about NBA basketball with people who actually cover NBA basketball with the media. My name is Lucas Weiss, host of Raptors Endgame, and I'm pleased to be joined by Raptors writer for Complex Canada and one of our own writers as well at Raptors Republic, Vivek Jacob. Vivek, what's going on, man? Not much. Coming off another win for the Raptors, 2-0 up in the series, looking for their first sweep, looking good. So, yeah, can't complain right now. First, it would be their – I believe they're up 2-0 for the first time since 2018 back against the Washington Wizards, which feels like another, you know, another world given where we are right now currently yeah, in the pandemic. Yeah. So, no question. But uh, very, very exciting – Nonetheless, but, but, but before we get into the actual basketball, is I want to talk to you about this matchup and, of course, game two. It's, what have been just the challenges of covering the team remotely? Because I know that all the media have been used to this from I mean, a year ago. It was the Raptors and their championship run, and everyone is coming to Toronto, the whole NBA media world. But now it's like we're all in Zoom calls, and except for very few that – have the fortunate or unfortunate pleasure, how you, depending on how you look at it, of being there live in Orlando. So what's the challenge been like for you? To be honest with you, uh, most of it has been positive. I mean, I would say in terms of actually feeling the atmosphere, that's probably the biggest thing you miss and just catching certain things when you're at the game. Uh, that's obviously something that you miss. But in terms of my convenience, you know, even, even today, for example, uh, I was cooking lunch during the game. So that's something obviously I wouldn't be able to do if I was at the game, but uh, things like that is just a lot easier working from home in terms of planning my schedule. And uh, you know, when there's a scrum or whatever it is after practice, uh, I'm just able to hop on a zoom. I don't, I don't have to get down to the OVO athletic center. So uh, again, that's another positive. So yeah, I, I would say in terms of convenience, it's, it's been a plus, but, in terms of feeling the atmosphere and, you know, so much of what we do is based on what we're seeing. And so uh, for everyone to just sort of be consuming it through the TV uh, or computer, however you're watching uh, on a stream, uh, I, I think that that's probably the main uh, disadvantage. And I also think too, Vivek, it's just the notion of not being able to get maybe those, locker room quotes that really turn into a beautiful story on a certain game or a player or the team itself. Whereas it's all, yeah. it's all over zoom, right? So everyone who's on that zoom call has access to the same quote. It's not like you're asking Fred Van Vliet or Marcus Gasol want to want to, you know, a, you know, a quote for a story. So that must be a little bit challenging as well, but I guess it's what you got to do given these circumstances. Yeah. Those are the circumstances. It is what it is. Everyone's kind of been been uh, dealt the same hand, so to speak. But I guess you know, individually for me, I would say, you know, the the challenge now becomes whereas, say, if you're in a scrum, you want to ask a question, you just sort of wait for a little pause and you get your question in. Now, you know, you're raising your hand, but no matter what, you're going to be behind sort of the people who are, who are who are more established, and so sometimes you might not even be able to get your question in, right? And then, as you said. Uh, in a live scenario, when you're at the game, if you don't get your question, question in, you can still try to, you know, go to the locker room and ask someone and find someone. Uh, but now it's just a situation where if you don't get to ask, you don't really just, you just sort of move on and hope, uh, hope that uh, someone else asks it or, you know, you just use whatever you have. Let's get into game two and of the Raptors Nets. Of course, the Raptors win 104 to 99, taking a 2 0 series lead. And let's face it, Vivek, this was, you know, an, an ugly slug fest of a game for a large part of it until the fourth quarter. And, and I think it was really interesting when, when Raptors head coach Nick Nurse decided to put Pascal Siakam at the five and then three guards uh, Fred Van Vliet, Kyle Lowry, and Norm Powell. What were your thoughts on that adjustment and, and just from your breakdown, you know, I know it's a few hours since the game, but you know, how, how well did it work in your opinion? Yeah, I think, I think it was a move more out of necessity. When you look at the way Marcus all struggled in this game, you look at Serge Ibaka, he wasn't great either. 
I, I think it was just something that was dictated by the circumstances. And I thought they played really well. Like, like Nick Nurse said after the game, uh, ultimately he wanted to make sure he had the best five players in the game uh, on the floor to close it. And those were the best five players that, that he could have out there. Norm, I thought, was outstanding in this game, just really finding the gaps uh, effectively and finishing and scoring with efficiency. And I think overall, when you look at that lineup, you have the strength of OG. You have uh, Pascal Siakam's versatility as well. He can, you know, defend the five in a pinch. And so the uh, ability to switch that all, all those guys have and then uh, the smarts of Fred Van Vliet and Kyle Lowry, I think uh, there were maybe uh, a bit more difficulties offensively uh, than you'd like to see with that five-man unit to close out that game. But uh, I thought I thought they were effective enough to get the job done Consider the options Nick Nurse had. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and you just look at the numbers. Marcus Gasol, zero points. He was zero of two from the field. Baca only had eight points, three of nine from the field. But you speak of Norman Powell, and you look at Powell's game, 24 points, 11 of 17 from the field. And, and you touched on it a bit in your answer, just his ability to drive the basket, really finish well at the rim, something that we saw a lot of flashes of this season and and if, if he can if he can do that Vivek like at a consistent level that's a huge win here for the Raptors especially for a sixth man because look against teams that you know may have star power you may you know need to find someone off the bench to provide that much needed offense yeah no question and I think the biggest plus with Norman Powell this season is he has been consistent if you look at uh, the season as a whole, outside of the injuries, whenever he's played, he's been really great. I think uh, if we all recall back when the Raptors had their first road trip of the season, there was a game uh, on that West Coast trip where Nick Nurse basically challenged Norm to be consistent because he had uh, a really strong finish to that series uh, and a strong game in Dallas. And Nick Nurse just straight up said, hey, you know, the thing with Norm we got to get past is sometimes it's zero, sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's 15. You know, how do we get that consistency? And ever since then, I feel like, you know, whether that lit a fire under him or whatever it may be, uh, he's been really consistent. And kudos to him because uh, it, at training camp, he made it clear that he really did want the starting shooting guard position uh, and wanted to be a starter on this team. Fred Van Vliet obviously took ownership of that pretty quickly. And so for him to settle into a role where he's really leading the bench unit, uh, I, I think it's a huge plus for the Raptors going forward because, again, we, we, we saw at times uh, with this Raptors offense in the half court when they can't create transition opportunities, uh, he's someone uh, that can not only, you know, as things get bogged down in the half court, can make that quick cut and just get you an easy basket. But he's also able to help you fuel that transition game when it's not there. And so uh, I, I think he really provides the Raptors with that X factor that they'll need uh, in the series to come. And he also got that emphatic dunk, uh, which I know, you, you know you're a Raptors story, and it was a throwback to game five, Indiana Pacers, that uh, – when playoff Powell was was born, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, yeah, that was vintage. When you when you see him throw down a dunk like that, it brings back all those memories, and obviously a fond one for the Raptors to come through in a big game and we'll eventually go on to win that series. But yeah, well, when playoff Powell is around, you know, you know he's someone that can uh, change the game in a hurry. Another topic, I think, is Pascal Siakam. And, and of course, look, you know, Nick Nurse before the game, Pascal, 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 Pascal. And just talking about how, you know, this guy is still very good and he's still adjusting to the role of being a number one scorer. And, and look, there, there is a ceiling there. There's still areas of improvement. And while he didn't, you know, match, let's say, an, an average scoring total today, I thought he was very effective – defensively today, particularly on Karis LeVert of the Brooklyn Nets. Can you yeah. just highlight that matchup and what you saw there just because of what Siakam did to really slow one of the Nets' main offensive options in LeVert? Yeah, I think 
right off the top, Pascal just had a, a different type of energy about him. I think uh, it's something that's become synonymous with his game, the energy on both ends of the floor, being a complete two-way player. And I thought he was making the right decisions. I mean, I think for the most part, he has been making good decisions. That's the part where uh, I haven't really become concerned because he is doing the right things. If he was really forcing his shots, then I'd say, you know, this is a problem. But I think for the most part, he's done a good job of finding his teammates and sort of riding whoever else is hot. And so I know there's criticisms to be made with uh, him not finishing the way we're necessarily accustomed to at, around the basket. But I, th I, I still think the decision making is where it needs to be. Uh, and then the shots, you expect them to sort of come around. Again, this is someone who didn't play basketball for a long time because of the lockdown. He's cooped up in his condo, no access to uh, a court. And so you have to factor that in into him just working his way back. And it, maybe it, maybe it's it's something that needs more than eight seeding games. And yeah. I mean, again, he didn't even, even he didn't even play all, all eight seeding games. Uh, he rested that final one. So it, it seems like he's working himself back. He's, uh, someone that you know plays off the crowd, plays off that energy, and so that's another thing that he's got to get accustomed to, just finding his own way of getting himself amped up for the game. And so, yeah, overall, I thought this was a, a better performance, a, a more complete performance on both ends. As far as the matchup with Lavert was concerned, I thought uh, Lavert really found a comfort zone in terms of the the way. Uh, that the Raptors were defending him early with, you know, when Van Vliet and Gasol were looking to trap him. And, you know, I, I think Levert can just see over uh, Van Vliet and main passes. And uh, even at times when he was digging into Van Vliet and getting into the mid range, uh, I thought he was just able to pull up and shoot the jumper with pretty uncontested. So I think those are the areas that Siakam was able to address. And again, when you put that type of length on someone, uh, it, it narrows your your view, the the space you have to to make a decision. And again, when if you're going up for a jumper, uh, it's a tough shot to get over Pascal Siakam. No, for sure. And and you just see in the numbers with Karis Levert, you know, five of twenty two from the field. So clearly, when you have someone big there like Siakam on Levert, it, it really helps on that defensive side. But I think you mentioned something in your answer that was really interesting. And I'm curious your thoughts of just following the team, covering the team, and that's just dealing with no fans in the stands. And I know it's different for everyone. And I'm sure the players are getting sick of getting asked this question by media members by now, but this is the playoffs and Scotiabank yeah. arena, as we all know, it's, it, it's raucous come playoff time. And to now play with just peppered in crowd noise how, in your opinion, is it affecting the Raptors players? And what have you heard from them that, that sort of illustrates whether they're be, you know, whether they, they, they tune it out and dial in or are they actually negatively impacted by it in any way? I think they've definitely tried to make the most of it. They've, they've accepted that there's no way, I mean, Fred Van Vliet said this, there's no way you can duplicate 20,000 of the best fans in the NBA. Uh, going crazy for you and so uh, for them they've tried to create their own energy and you know they're cheering from the bench as much as they can they're trying to get each other amped up uh, you know they, they talked about how watching their family members introduce them in the starting lineups was a special feeling and so maybe there's some of that energy that they can channel uh, but beyond that I, I will say that they, the other thing they've talked about is in some ways, the quietness has helped in, helped them lock in a bit more, and uh, you know the communication is is easier. Nick Nurse has talked about how you know he he doesn't have to <laughs> lose his voice over the course of the game because it's just a lot easier to just have a normal conversation without raising his voice. And so those are the aspects where it's helping them. I think with Siakam, maybe it just you know again. Get, just getting used to playing uh, at a high level again was going to take some time because of how long he went without it. Uh, let's face it, he came to the game late uh, at 15, 16 years old, and he's been playing it nonstop ever since. So this is the longest stoppage he's ever had. So I, th I, th I think it has more to do with that. Uh, the energy, the last thing I'll say is like Fred Van Vliet said, 
it's the playoffs now. So if you're looking for external factors to get you amped up, then maybe this isn't for you. Yeah. And, and look, you know, you speak of Nick Nurse, he's not going to need those fisherman friends anymore just because uh, <laughs> compared to uh, of, of, of years past. But you mentioned Fred Van Vliet. And, and look, this is someone that, you know, again, he's all about bet on yourself. He's all about, you know, that's, that's his mantra. And we saw from, of course, last year earning an, an, an MVP vote in the NBA Finals. Uh, with his performance there in, in, against the Golden State Warriors, and it just continuing on, Vivek. And for me, I'm just you know I you know I look at today in Game Two. Look, they're they're not you know they're they're feeling sluggish. They're not making their shots, and he starts to get them back in the game with a little run. And I just think, and of course we know his defensive ability. It's just continuing for Fred VanVleet, just a great play. Yeah, he is. I really believe that. Even from, you know, he went into the championship summer, found ways to, got, uh, to get better uh, and showcase it before the lockdown. And I really think that between whatever happened between the lockdown and the resumption, uh, he found a way to get better again uh, on top of what he did. Now, I know the numbers don't quite show it in terms of his finishing at the rim, but it just seems like uh, he's, he's a bit more comfortable around the basket now. Uh, and then the extended range he's showing, uh, that that's just opening everything up for the Raptors offense to be able to hit the shots from where he is. I mean, uh, it, there were a couple of times he was, he was near the logo and it looked like he was looking at the basket trying to pull, pull you know, uh, a dame uh, yeah. from there. But uh, I think his confidence is sky high. He, I, I, I think he might be the best Raptor uh, as far as the bubble games are concerned and his ability to create now both off the bounce uh, and, and, and his range, I think he is sort of, you know, the best initiator for the Raptors half court offense right now. Yeah. And you mentioned the range and it's just, you just look at the shot charts, man, like this where he's, he's hitting those shots and it's clear that, over the lockdown and from from the pause to now that he's really put it put an effort on that and he said that in, in some of the zoom media sessions and it's just been it's, it's great to see and I think it just adds such a new element to that Raptors offense just because of the fact that look I know that today you know 25 percent from three-point land isn't isn't necessarily great especially against more elite offenses but if they can get guys that can shoot from that range it could definitely help going forward against elite competition. Yeah, it just expands the distance that defenses have to cover. And I, again, I've made this point before. When you think back to when he struggled in last year's playoff against Orlando and against Philadelphia, they had tremendous length and athleticism where he wasn't even able to get his shot off. And so I think by extending his range, you've created that extra foot or extra two feet or whatever it may be that defenders have to go to get to him. And that's allowing him the time and space that he needs to get the shot off. And uh, kudos to him. Long may it continue. I know this is a Raptors centered podcast, but you know, I'd be remiss to talk about what Brooklyn did today. And I, and I thought that they made a lot of really nice adjustments on yeah on the Raptors heading, heading into this one. And look, this is a team that is, you know, doesn't have Kate, Kevin Durant, doesn't have Kyrie's dealing with a plethora of injuries and, and, and people with COVID-19 at the moment. And, and I think like next year, you're going to see what this team can really be when they're fully healthy. But when you're looking at the matchups today and, and the adjustments, Vivek, just how did that hinder this, the Raptors, offense particularly going with uh can't pronounce his name but tlc starting there instead of uh radian's courage and, and of course the defense of jared allen yeah i got you lucas timothy luau cabarro there you uh, go man sorry geez, <laughs> if you did not want to butcher that on the pod <laughs> that's okay i got you uh yeah tlc uh him, inserting him into the starting lineup obviously he started the second half in game one and that's when they were able to cut into the de deficit. So I, I think it was smart to ride that and make that unit a priority coming into game two. 
and again the, the extra shooting that he provided Corks has not shot the ball well this season so uh, I, I think he's been uh, a big positive for them and the overall in the bubble he's averaging about 15 points a game so uh, that's definitely a bright spot for them beyond that I think you know the adjustment of switching on everything I thought that was uh, something that really tested the Raptors offensively because it sort of challenged Kyle Lowry and Marcus All to both step outside of who they are. Uh, you look at when Marcus All was getting the ball against uh, smaller players, it's not in his nature to be aggressive and look for his shot. And so uh, that's what you, they're daring him to do by putting a smaller player on him. And then again, with Jared Allen, you got to be able to break him down. You got to be able to create off the bounce to get past a big like that. And so uh, that was another thing that presented a challenge to the Raptors. And again, the biggest thing for them is that over the course of a, of a game, they're able to sort of work their opponent down and figure out what's the best strategy to go to. And then late, you know, we saw the way Norman Powell was able to beat Jared Allen uh, in the corner for that dunk. Uh, and so little things like that where you've just got to be decisive and attack uh, and then positive things will happen. Yeah, and, and this is a team that you know they're they're pesky. They'll 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 wear you. They'll try to wear you down. They'll make it challenging. And I thought that earlier on they were they were getting out in transition, which you know getting that energy early on, which you know for the compared to the Raptors early on was sorry it was a little bit of a a struggle there. But I think for someone like Coach Jock Vaughn right now, who you know who knows what'll happen once once the season ends, but Certainly, he's done a nice job just given the pieces that, that he's had and, and without the, the, the top players on the team. What, what are your thoughts on what he's been able to do? Yeah, I, I, I think you look at the games in the bubble, the seeding games, plus the two playoff games, I would lean strongly towards keeping him as the head coach. For me, the biggest things I would look for are buy-in, the level of commitment that the players are showing. And you look at the way they were sort of, you know, punched in the mouth in game one to go down 30 plus and still, you know, put up a fight and cut the deficit down and make a game of it. Uh, I, I thought that was a positive sign. And then again, in game two, to show uh, a buy-in to the game plan uh, and the adjustments that he wanted to make, it seems like they enjoy playing for him. It seems like they play really hard. Those are the main things I look for. And so, you know, unless there's someone with significant pedigree that becomes available, uh, I feel like he should be their man going forward. Last question for you, Vivek. And no. and it's on, you know, just, you know, look, you know, obviously it looks like, you know, barring a, you know, a catastrophe, the Raptors will, will win this series. Who knows how many games, hopefully four games. But what is one – aspect of their game that you're looking for them to improve on for the next round, which potentially could be against the Boston Celtics? I think the biggest thing for me is the half court offense. Mm -hmm. you know, that, I think that has been a concern throughout the regular season. And uh, as, as much as we want to attribute it to the injuries and they did play a factor in stifling the Raptors in that area, and as much as, you know, we, we want to credit Marcus Gasol and say that he's just going to make all those problems disappear, I think uh, the reality is that there, there is a problem when it comes to consistently being able to create shots in the half court. And uh, we've, we've seen the way size can impact the Raptors. And so you talk about uh, going down the line, potentially facing uh, a Boston, especially when you look at – the defensive prowess of a Marcus Smart when you look at the length of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Uh, I think uh, their ability to switch will definitely test the Raptors. Uh, and, and, and again, you know, the, the other part of it is limiting the Raptors transition game. And uh, with those guys, Kemba Walker, all those guys, you know, they can create shots consistently. They take care of the ball. So it's going to be difficult for the Raptors to get out in transition as well. So, Again, uh, half-court offense is something that uh, they definitely want to keep testing themselves. I am encouraged. You know, we, we saw in game one Kyle get to the line. We saw 
Uh, Fred get to the line. We saw Siakam get to the line again here in this game. Siakam nine for nine at the free throw. Well, uh, nine free throw attempts, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. So those are things that uh, are encouraging in the half court set. And so that's the that's going to be the focus for these next two, you know, maybe more games. Vivek Jacob, he is a writer for Complex Canada, writer for Raptors Republic, and among other places, covering the Toronto Raptors. Vivek, thanks for stopping by Raptors Endgame and chat, chatting about the Raptors and the NBA playoffs. Thanks so much for having me, Lucas. This was a blast.